Good afternoon. Welcome to today's session. We're going to be talking about ArcGIS Online Security, a practical guide to ArcGIS Online Security. My name is Senta Sivabalan. I'm a program manager in the ArcGIS Online team. And I'm Mehul Choksi. I'm a senior principal product engineer for ArcGIS Online team. All right. Today, um, we are going to be uh, talking to you a little bit about the portal information model so that uh, you can see all of the components of the ArcGIS Online organization. And then we'll be going into how um, you can secure each of those components, the organization itself, members in the organization, groups, and content. And then we'll look into how you can monitor the organization as an administrator. If there's time, we'll also go into how ArcGIS Online complies with uh, security and privacy regulations. First off, ArcGIS Online is a multi-tenant system. What this means is that um, your ArcGIS Online organization lives alongside other organization in the same ecosystem. And what this allows for is a rich platform where you can create content and you can share it and other people can use it and you can use content that's created by other organizations. Your members can work with members in other organizations together in groups. So it, it uh, accounts for a, a rich ecosystem which uh, makes rich collaboration possible. And if two organizations need to work even closer together, um, we have something called the partner collaborations. And if you want to know more about partner collaborations, uh, you can search on YouTube for ArcGIS Online Partner Collaborations. You'll see a video that goes into it in more detail. So the first thing we're going to start with is the portal information model. At the heart of it is the ArcGIS Online organization, your organization. It's called Portal in the APIs. And the organization itself has members. And uh, members uh, own items. These are maps, apps, and layers. And uh, members work together in groups. They bring their items, and other members bring their items. And together, groups is what makes it possible to share content with a specific set of people and to work together on content. So uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the REST API uh, for, you know, I'll highlight the REST API, you know, what are the endpoints that you can use to work with each of the things I'm going to talk about. But you'll find information in our developers' uh, documentation on other uh, runtime SDKs and web SDKs. The portal itself, uh, it, that's your ArcGIS Online organization. And um, when you're signed in, the information about your organization is available at the portal self endpoint on the sharing API. That's, the, that's what we call the, the REST API for ArcGIS Online, the sharing API. And um, uh, if you're not signed in, you can find information about in, an organization through portal slash that organization's ID. And the information that you get back about the organization you know, um, has information on you know, whether the organization is public or private. Um, public organizations, uh, that's, a, that's an access setting you will use if you have an organization that's disseminating information to the public. And you may have a private organization if, if all of the work that you're doing is uh, you know, within your organization itself. And uh, every organization has a URL key property. This is a subdomain uh, for your organization. For example, yourorg.maps.arcgis.com. Uh, so now we'll uh, talk about securing your organization, and Mehul uh, will, will share that with us. Thank you, Senta. Uh, now we will talk about uh, the various authentication types, uh, followed by how you can configure those. And uh, if you were to develop an application, how you can connect to ArcGIS Online, followed by organizational security policies so that you can configure those to meet your security and privacy needs. Uh, starting off with uh, login types, primarily there are three broad categories of login types that we support. 
One is RGS logins, in which case you provide username and password to um, online. Uh, second category is enterprise logins, which uh, we uh, which uh, comes under like SAML and OpenID Connect, and then social logins, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and GitHub. We'll go through each of those in uh, details on what you can configure and how you can configure. Um, for RGS logins, um, you can specify the password policy uh, to increase the password entropy, uh, such as uh, length, uh, complexity, what characters you could use, and uh, how long the password could be valid for before it expires, and how many count of uh, previous users that you cannot reuse when setting a new password. Um, we also uh, support, for RGS logins, we also support multi-factor authentication. Um, the second factor for multi-factor authentication, uh, various factors supported are TOTP-based authenticator apps, uh, uh, security keys, uh, security hardware keys, uh, any hardware that supports U2F or universal second factor or web authn, uh, those are supported. Some of the examples are YubiKey, uh, uh, Windows Hello, uh, uh, Face ID, Touch ID, uh, and also the other second factor we support is recovery codes. Um, we recommend that multi-factor authentication be enabled for all organizations and two um, administrators are required at a minimum. Just to get a look at how it looks like, uh, uh, I am into the organization settings security. Uh, we also support for multi-factor authentication, enforcing of MFA, in which case users cannot sign in unless they set up MFA. Uh, and there could be cases where the user does not have uh, means to set up MFA uh, at, at a given time, so you could add it to the exempt, uh, exempt list. Uh, and there is a nice uh, blog that we have put out um, that explains step-by-step -step information about and what considerations you need to make uh, while setting up of MFA. In addition, we also support uh, in addition, we also support uh, uh, email verification, wherein you can, uh, as an administrator, prompt your members uh, uh, for the email verification uh, so that they can continue to receive the latest and greatest from the platform uh, on any activities that occur on their account. Next up, um, we have uh, organization-specific logins, which specifically talk about OpenID Connect first and they're followed by SAML. So o OpenID Connect uh, is built on top of OAuth 2.0. It, it is a means to uh, authenticate. Uh, uh, it is JSON-based. Some of the examples are OAuth and Google. Uh, as an administrator, you could, uh, if it is configured in your, on your org, you can invite users automatically, or you can add, uh, send an invitation to the user uh, and uh, to join the org. Uh, also, uh, recently, we, in the recent release, we started supporting group claims. So this brings us at parity with uh, the enterprise groups that we had supported for a long time for SAML. Uh, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, how to configure those. Uh, First, um, for saving time, I I've taken a screenshot uh, of uh, the most relevant area. So I am here, I am signed into Okta uh, and trying to configure an Okta OpenID Connect. Uh, here, I I'm uh, under Applications, uh, Create an uh, App Integration. Once uh, you select that, you select OpenID Connect Web Mapping Application. Uh, once uh, you provide the redirect URI, uh, you get a client ID and secret. Along with this information, as part of the OpenID Connect, all the providers that support OpenID are required to publish out a well-known URL. Uh, for this well-known URL has all the other information that you need to configure OpenID Connect on online. Once you have uh, all this information, you go to online. I'm under security, uh, uh, organization settings, security, uh, and uh, logins. 
And if I click on um, a configure OpenID Connect login, this is the uh, 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 options that I need to fill out based on the configuration that I did on the Okta side. Once I uh, save all of this, I get um, the redirect URI uh, that I need to provide uh, over to the uh, OpenID Connect. Um, so the login, logout, re redirect URI, this is what I, I need to copy and paste it over on the Okta registered app integration uh, uh, here. W once I have that, uh, then that, that's all is needed to configure. Uh, once it is configured, then uh, uh, the sign-in page would something it looks something like this with an uh, Okta login. Let me uh, refresh this just to make sure. Um, uh, and once you click on it, um, uh, you, you would be pr prompted to sign in. And uh, once you provide the password, Uh, you get signed in. Um, so let me try one more time. Okay, uh, get the point. Uh, um, then uh, we, uh, next up, uh, we have. Um, uh, SAML. Uh, for SAML is, uh, again, an open industry standard for authentication. So here, um, uh, XML is used as a payload as compared to JSON for OpenID Connect, and it is used for authentication. And a couple of examples of SAML-based uh, 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 providers are uh, Microsoft Entry-ID, uh, Cibolet, uh, and NetIQ Access Manager. Uh, again, same thing with uh, OpenID Connect. As an administrator, uh, you can uh, add users automatically or invite users, and you, uh, even the groups uh, are supported uh, for SAML. So the advantage here for the administrator, as an administrator, is that identity and the groups are managed on the identity provider side, and that flows in once the user signs in. Uh, as uh, as an end user who is trying to sign in, uh, they can reuse the same user uh, username. They don't have to create another username and password and manage, and they get a single sign-on. So it's, uh, it works uh, on both fronts, uh, both to manage identity, groups man uh, group membership management, and ease of use for signing in. Uh, so um, let's uh, take a look at the uh, de demo for SAML login. So here, um, I'm logged in. Uh, I'm on the sign-in page here. I have configured a SAML login. Um, using this login, um, I just got signed in uh, automatically. So, uh, you, so what what just happened here is that when I clicked on that sign-in button, uh, it, it redirected me to the identity provider. Uh, identity provider uh, had uh, I was already uh, signed in in the browser for uh, other session. Uh, so it took my credentials and uh, validated it and then returned a, something called as assertion. So assertion is nothing but a XML payload that gets uh, transferred between um, the identity provider and ser service provider, in this case, online. Uh, it, it has uh, information. Uh, uh, it, it provides means to securely transfer the information between uh, the identity provider and uh, service provider. Uh, the details uh, of that uh, would look something like this. It contains the status, whether the authentication was successful or not. Uh, it also has information about the user that signed in. And again, it also has signature, so it cannot be tempered with. And there are other additional checks that can be uh, that are put in place. Uh, like this payload is valid only between certain durations. You can encrypt the entire payload if uh, this, even the profile information is sensitive enough. So you could configure all that. Uh, once the online side receives this payload, it validates whether it's from the intended uh, provider and 
uh, it has not been tempered with. It exchanges the token with an access token. Um, and using the access token, the user gets signed in. So th th that's how the sign-in works uh, for SAML. In, in general, uh, uh, so the next part uh, we'll talk about is how to configure the SAML logins. Um, so for, uh, for, for the SAML login, um, let's see. Um, uh, for the SAML login, uh, I, I've signed into Azure uh, Microsoft Entra ID. Uh, so what I've created here is like uh, I've gone to all services, app registrations, register an application, enterprise application, and I've uh, created a enterprise application. Once you create that, you get uh, uh, app federation metadata URL. Uh, you need to copy that, and the uh, that contains information again about. Uh, what uh, URL I need uh, to redirect to for authentication, what will be my public key uh, with which you need to encrypt the data that I, you need uh, to send it over, uh, and what will be the information that I'll be sending upon uh, authentication. So uh, all this information is configured on online side. So on, on the online, on the right-hand side, I am signed into an online org as an administrator, and I go here on uh, the login section uh, under uh, security, um, I create new SAML login, and then uh, paste uh, this metadata URL that I got uh, from uh, enterprise application. Uh, here, I, I specify the label that would show up on the sign-in page. And then uh, I provide the met, uh, metadata URL here, and then click Save. Uh, once I save, um, I'll get a download button uh, to uh, specify uh, to download the service metadata, service provided metadata from online. So it, it has similar information, uh, such as like upon um, uh, upon authentication, where, where should the uh, identity providers send the payload to. And it also has a, a public part of the certificate to sign uh, the payload that comes, comes back to online so that only the uh, online can decrypt that payload. So uh, once I download that uh, service provider XML file, I, I need to provide that and upload that uh, on the enterprise application here, uh, upload metadata file. W once you set that up, uh, that, that's what it takes to configure. So uh, things are configured on both sides, and you are ready to go with, uh, with the SAML login. Uh, there are a couple of additional things um, that you need to uh, look out for uh, as part of configuration um, under advanced settings. Uh, you need to make sure that um, you have uh, enabled uh, signed request, uh, encrypted assertions, and if you want to manage group uh, uh, membership, you can enable, uh, enable it right here as an administrator so that uh, the assertions that are sent between online and enterprise, uh, you continue to uh, get those group claims that, uh, that get updated at the time of uh, user signing in. So that's for the SAML logins. Um, next up, um, uh, we, we, um, so now that you have configured uh, login options, you would want to connect, uh, you, you develop an app and you want to connect to RGS online. So in general, uh, for the apps that you create, it always uh, has to start with OAuth, uh, uh, you have to start with OAuth 2.0 with an authorized call. Uh, so how, how you do it, uh, the pattern is similar. Like wh whichever uh, uh, provider you need to connect to, you generally um, create an application in that provider, get the client ID, and pr uh, put it in the app that you want to connect uh, from. So in this case, 
uh, if you are, as a developer, uh, are creating an app, uh, you create an application in your online org, and I, I'll walk you through that process. Um, uh, basically, the process involves uh, cre uh, registering an application. As part of registration, you provide a redirect URI, and then uh, upon registration, you get client ID. Using that client ID, you embed in your application. Uh, and uh, the way it looks like in online uh, is as follows. Um, uh, under the content part of uh, your organization, uh, create new item and then select developer credentials option. Uh, once you select that, um, uh, you, uh, you specify the redirect URI and uh, uh, the name of the application. And it, it would uh, create an item, but also re register that ap application. And you will get a client ID. W once you have this client ID uh, specified, uh, you, you can write a, sim a simple, uh, here is a simple demo app uh, that, that uses JavaScript, uh, as, um, maps for JavaScript uh, uh, SDK. Uh, using Identity Manager, it abstracts all the uh, handling of the token management. So all you need to do is uh, specify the client ID uh, here, uh, the organization URL that you need to connect to, uh, and just handle what you want to do upon signing in. So in this application, I'm just displaying the username, first name, and last name of the signed-in user, and what you need to do at the sign-out. So this is a a simple demo app that is hosted on uh, github.io. Uh, so I, I, I just uh, sign in. And since uh, it will ask me to sign in, upon signing in, it returned first name and last name. Uh, and then you can sign out. So this is how you connect your own application to RGS online. Um, next. Uh, 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 now that you have uh, uh, how you can connect to uh, uh, connect your application to online, and you talked about uh, how you uh, various authentication options that you have, um, let's talk about the organizational policies that you can configure to meet your security and privacy needs. Uh, one of, one of the pro property that you can configure is allowing anonymous access or not. The use case is that uh, as a as a company, you, you might want to uh, put out a website that uh, uh, for the world to see, for example, like new product announcements and other for marketing purposes. But there could be some companies that are uh, uh, using RGS online in the private capacity that only their members should be able to sign in. In that case, they don't want their homepage, for example, to be uh, visible to anyone. So uh, if you set anonymous access to uh, toggle off the anonymous access, then uh, you won't be, uh, you will be prompted to sign in uh, when you navigate to that uh, organization URL. Uh, for privacy reasons, a uh, lot of the times, you wouldn't want your members to uh, make uh, their profile public. Uh, so you, as an administrator, you could uh, control uh, uh, control that. Uh, same thing with the content. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, sharing content is not um, not permissible under da data uh, privacy uh, compliance for a company. So in that case, you you could turn that uh, 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 sharing to public off. Uh, uh, as an organization policy. The same thing with searching content outside. So uh, at times, uh, uh, as a company, you wouldn't want your members to use copyrighted co content from outside. So you, you could control that aspect of it uh, with this uh, organization setting uh, policy. Um, uh, 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 following along on that lines, uh, th there would be uh, cases where you would want to uh, make your uh, employees aware or the members aware of uh, certain policies uh, before they get into the application, uh, uh, such as like uh, data compliance again. Uh, so we, there, there's a means to configure access notice uh, for the members. 
and if they don't accept the terms, they, they will not be allowed to uh, sign in. Uh, there would be cases where you would want to make uh, users aware of uh, the uh, aware of what they are signing into. So th there is a way to uh, configure publicly available message that shows up before the user signs in. And we also have means to configure informational banner, which uh, shows up at the top and the bottom of the page. Uh, uh, the example of setting those up would be like if there is a ongoing maintenance or a scheduled maintenance that has to happen uh, within certain times. So you, you could, ha as an administrator, set that for your members to see. Um, uh, other policy uh, that you could uh, set is uh, allow origin, in which case uh, you could limit the number of uh, limit the number of domains that your application can connect to via the REST API. It's based off of a course across origin resource sharing, uh, in which case um, the server indicates what domains to uh, connect to uh, via the HTTP headers and uh, the browser is the one that enforces that. The he headers are access control allow origin and access control allow credentials. Um, uh, 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 another policy related to application, and this is a big one, is, is to uh, allow only the approved apps, uh, external apps for the members to sign in. So th this is really helpful from a security sense point because in this case, they your members will not be handing over the token to another app that you uh, don't uh, trust. Um, over to you, Senta, for securing members' contents and groups. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about, uh, so far we've talked about how to secure the organization, how to uh, control, you know, how people, how your members sign into the organization, and, uh, you know, security policy for the whole organization, and also how your members, you know, you can create as a developer, you can create apps to, um, you know, that, that permit members of your organization to sign in. So now we are gonna talk about how to secure the members within your organization, content, which is items in the organization, and groups. So members in the organization, um, you know, these are the people in your organization and, um, in the REST API, members are called users. So the um, REST API to get information on a member is under community users and the username of the user. So um, um, you know the you can you can use that endpoint community users and the username to get information about uh, a particular user, uh, and you can. Uh, Similar to the organization self, uh, you could also get uh, use community self to get information about the signed in user. So um, some of the information that's available on the user, the username, the full name of the user, uh, the culture information, that's the, the, the settings that the user has selected, the language, the region, et cetera, and the thumbnail or the profile picture of the user, all of that's available under this user endpoint, and then some more information that we'll go into uh, in a little bit as well. So members in the organization own items, and they also own groups. They can also belong to groups that are owned by other members. And uh, member profiles can be visible, uh, and the, the, the setting for um, setting the Profile visibility of a member is called access. It's a, it's a property on the user. And um, there are three settings that are possible. A member profile can be private, which means only the member and the administrators of the organization will be able to see the member profile. It could be shared with the organization. In this case, um, all the members of the organization that have the privilege to view other organization members would be able to see the profile of this member. Uh, it could be set to uh, public, which means that everyone in the ArcGIS Online ecosystem would be able to see this member's um, profile. And, and you, would, you, know, you would set a member's profile to public if, for example, they are sharing content on behalf of the organization and it is, you know, it's, it's helpful to see who it is that, uh, that created this content. Now, admins can allow members or prevent members from changing their 
um, profile visibility. So you could have an organization where it's the admin that's controlling the profile visibility of each of the members, or you can have an organization where every member can um, control their own profile visibility. So, and that, that is a setting under organization settings security. And every member in the organization has a user type. This user type is what's um, you know, controlling the functionality that's available to the member, that the member is licensed for. And this includes the apps that the user can use, as well as the privileges that the user can have. Now, the, the privileges that the user can have is gonna depend upon what functionality is gonna be available to them in several apps. For example, if the member has a, 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 the creator user type, then the member is licensed to use Map Viewer, and then they also have the privileges to create maps using Map Viewer. However, if the member has a, the viewer user type, they can they are licensed to uh, use Map Viewer, but they can only view maps. They can't create them because they don't have uh, privileges for creating content. So that's the user type. It's what a member is licensed to do. Now the organization can constrict what the user can actually do by assigning a role to them. And the role is just a subset of the privileges that the user, uh, that the organization is permitting the, the, that member to have access to. Um, for example, a member with a creator user type can be an organization admin. However, the, admi the organizations typically don't want all of their creator users um, to become admins. So they, they may say that uh, many of the creator users have, say, a publisher role, which means that they can create content, publish feature layers. However, they will not be able to administer the organization. So that's how the organization limits what the member can, is permitted to do using roles. Now, there are some times when an organization wants to add additional um, applications and user type extensions um, to this user. So the user, uh, to permit the user to access more apps, more user type extensions, these are add-ons that the administrator can, uh, administrator can assign to a member. And here's a look at um, you know the you know an editor user type in in the org um, in the organization's um, organization page under licenses and user type. You can the administrator can have a look at what each of the user types in the organization has access to, and, and this is a visualization of that. And, and and an editor, for instance, has essential apps as well as office apps as well as. ArcGIS runtime basic. So this is this is just a, a visual of hey, this is what uh, a, a, a particular user type has access to. And um, the user type, um, additional information about the user type is available through the REST API. On the user endpoint, uh, there's information on what particular user type that that user has been assigned. For instance, here it's, it's creator. And under the user's um, user license type endpoint, there's more information about exactly what is uh, included in the creator user type, all of the apps that are included and so forth. And as I mentioned earlier, member roles constrict what the user al is allowed to do in the organization. And the organization is what is setting up that member role and assigning it to the member. ArcGIS Online comes with certain built-in roles, administrator, data editor, publisher, viewer, et cetera. But a really powerful um, tool is, uh, for the administrator is this ability to create custom roles by which the administrator can really fine-tune exactly what a set of members can do. And in the REST API, um, if you look at the, the user endpoint, uh, you know the the role is a property, and uh, also you'd be able, uh, you'll you'll see all the list of all of the privileges that are included in that role. And privileges are those fine grained um, items within a role, and um, all of these privileges are uh, you know controlling what this user is is um, 
is allowed to do in the organization. And if, um, you know, as an admin, you go into the organization settings under uh, member roles, you'd be able to see, if you open up a particular role, you'll be able to see a listing of all of the fine-grained privileges that are included in a role. And uh, in the same place, you'd, you'd also be able to create custom roles. So in addition to you know, assigning member user types and roles, an administrator can also manage uh, other members' items, their groups, their profile. They can manage uh, members as a whole, you know, adding and inviting members, deleting members, disabling member accounts. Um, they can also create these custom, ad, uh, custom roles, especially if you use these custom administrator roles, uh, because sometimes some admin um, um, you know, uh, actions would need to be shared. For example, you may need an admin who can simply you know, reset passwords. You may, you may need an admin who can assign licenses. You may need an admin who is a content manager who can administer content across all, all of the members. So you, know, you could have a specific custom administrator, administrator roles created uh, that, that uh, fit your organization's workflow. Next, in the organization, you have content. So members in the organization own items. That we call, the, call that as content. Now, content itself has, you know, all of the, uh, the types for the content is maps, layers, apps, et cetera, et cetera. And content is private by default. But a content can be shared to groups, to the organization, or to the whole of the ArcGIS Online um, ecosystem when it is set to public, when the access is set to public. And uh, for any particular item to get information about the item, that uh, information is available uh, in the REST API under content items slash item ID. And the way um, an ax uh, the item can be shared is, uh, is in two different ways. One is by setting its access to, um, you know, to, to private, which means only the owner and the admins of the organization can see it. If the access is set to the organization, then all members in the organization with the privilege to see content in the organization, they'll be able to see that item. Um, and access can be set to public, which means everyone in the ArcGIS Online uh, ecosystem can see that item. And um, if an item needs to be shared with only a few people, then those few people can be invited or added to a group, and this item could be added to that group, and that way uh, the item is now available to just the members of the group. When it comes to sharing feature layers, there's more uh, fine-grained options. One of the options is to say, hey, um, this feature layer, uh, you know, for, should it be editable? That's one, one you know, and if it is going to be editable, uh, you can actually control, can people, should people only add items, only update items, sorry, only add features, only update features, or only delete features, or some combination of, of these three. And uh, in addition to uh, setting the edit access for a feature layer, it's also possible to create view feature layers uh, with a subset of the features, that subset of the records, if you will, in the, in, the, in the feature layer, and a subset of the attributes, a subset of the columns. And then for that subset, that's the view feature layer, you can also say, you know, what kind of edit access is going to be permitted. You know, is, it, is editing allowed? Is it only add, only update, only delete, or some combination of these? So now looking at groups, you know, groups, as we talked about earlier, they contain items and they contain members. Now, um, and, and so groups is a way to provide access to a specific set of users uh, and uh, to a specific set of items. So the group owner can also promote one of the members in the group to become a group manager. And then a group manager can you know, help administer the group. So um, uh, when that happens, that, you know, that member has to be uh, an, in the same organization. 
However, uh, it's possible if you have a partner collaboration to make a group manager, makes, make a group member a group manager from a partnered collaboration. So that's, that's an extra uh, capability that comes with partnered collaborations that allows for close collaboration between organizations. And the community uh, groups endpoint gives, access, gives information about, about a group. And the access to a group is also similarly patterned, just like access to an item. It could be private, meaning the only the owner and the administrators of the organization have access to the group. It could be set to organization, in which case the group is visible to the organization. But if a, an organization member goes and visits the group and they are not a member of the group, they'll see all of the items in the group that they already have access to. So, to see all of the items in the group, then the group, uh, then the member the, who's looking at the group should be a member of the group as well. Then they have access to everything in the group. Otherwise, they can look at the group and only the items that they already have access to. Same thing, uh, it, this, this happens with the um, public groups as well. So for instance, what this means is that you can create a group and you can make it public. And uh, anybody in Arctis Online would be able to see the group and if you have public items in the group, they'll see the public items too. But to see some of the non-public items, they'd either have to be a member of the group, or if there are items in the group that are shared to the organization, then anybody in your organization would be able to see those items. So um, the access to the group is, is controlled by this access, but the access to the item in the group is controlled by the access to the item itself. And um, on a group, it's possible to finally control you know, who can join the group, the group membership, and then who can contribute content to the group. The, uh, the way the group membership is, is, is uh, controlled is by saying that, hey, uh, some, for, some group mem uh, for some groups, they may be administrative groups, where the administrator wants to control who is in the group, and then the persons that are in the group should not be able to leave because the administrator needs to know for sure that, hey, if it's Department B, I want to be sure that all of the members of Department B are in this group. So in which case, um, you know, leaving is disallowed in these types of groups. And then you, you may have groups with open membership where anybody can join. You can have groups where, um, um, you know, it's, it's by invitation only. And you can have groups with, uh, that are based on an enterprise group. The membership is based on an enterprise group. These are SAML or OpenID Connect groups. And, um, and then uh, Mehul talked about how you may have to make it possible to, when you're setting up the login, to allow those uh, group membership to also flow through. So we also um, can, can control how content gets into a group. You know, is it only the group owner and administrator who can contribute content to the group, or can all members of the group uh, contribute content? And we have special groups called shared update groups where um, all of the items in the group can be edited by uh, all of the members in the group. So this is like you have a project and you're really closely collaborating on this project. You know, everybody needs to, in the group, needs to be able to edit the web map Everybody needs to be able to edit an app in the, in the, in the group. That's when you would have a shared update group. And um, one of the restrictions here is that all members in a shared update group should be from the same organization or they can come in from a partnered collaboration. So these are ways in which you can um, set up groups um, you, you know, to match your needs. Next up, um, monitoring your organization. Mehul's going to go over that. So now you have a configured authentication, uh, organization policies, how you can connect and figure out the sharing access on the items, groups, and members. Uh, it would be time to monitor. So that's the next logical step. The reasons why you would want to monitor uh, is uh, maybe uh, like uh, the credit consumption goes high in certain cases, or uh, like if there are lots of views on certain items, uh, just to know what's going on uh, in, in your organization. Uh, so we provide uh, various 
things that can be tracked. One, one is like the activity, what the user does uh, on an, uh, in an organization, uh, how the credit consumption is, uh, uh, what items are created, the views count on it, uh, or uh, the service usage in general. There are two ways that it can be monitored. One is through status dashboard. It looks something like this. Um, uh, so the status board, dashboard looks something like this, uh, wherein there are various tabs to see uh, what's going on uh, for the uh, on the groups like who is creating and who the members are, what apps have been created when they were signed in, how the content is, or even uh, for the credits, how the credits are consumed, uh, by which services, and uh, the, uh, the details about it. Uh, the, an another way is uh, to generate reports, uh, either through one time, or uh, you could schedule a report and uh, on a weekly, monthly cadence. Um, and again, all these options are available for a generating a report. Those are CSV-based report, and one of the samples that I've generated, uh, the report looks something like this, um, with various fields, and we have documentation on what each field uh, represents. So that, that's for the monitoring. Um, next, uh, we'll talk about uh, trust. Um, so we have a, a, for security and compliance, um, we have a site stood up uh, called trust.rgs.com. So it, it has a documentation about uh, the security, the privacy, and the compliance, and uh, what uh, ESRI provides in, on this front. And it is also a means to responsibly disclose vulnerability if it is found uh, in the software. So. Uh, yeah, um, we, we are currently FedRAM compliant, ta tailored low, and we are looking towards uh, moderate. Uh, we take privacy very seriously, and if there are concerns uh, or issues or questions, let us know. Um, yeah. uh, um, okay, which uh, brings us to the end of our session. And uh, we're open to questions now, and please share your feedback on the app as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. I know in our OAuth 2.0, um, you can choose either SAML or OAuth 2.0 with OIDC. Is there a preference you guys have over one of those? Let me uh, repeat the question for the recording. The question is whether there's a preference between SAML and OpenID Connect. And SAML is older. Is there any advantage to OpenID Connect? My whole um, yeah, so uh, b both are industry standards. Um, uh, there is no preference one over the other. Both, uh, one is JSON-based, lightweight, um, used by a lot of lightweight applications. It's easy to configure and stuff like that. Uh, whereas um, the SAML is more matured and it has more options uh, on the uh, security side. So it depends on which one you are using. So there is no uh, preference or bias as such on which one to use. Just to add, um, one of the reasons why a couple of folks were not using it because we were not supporting group membership, like enterprise groups. Groups management was not supported for OpenID Connect up until recently, but now we have added support for it. So it becomes functionally equivalent. So uh, we, we don't see a reason uh, to choose one or the other, just purely based on functionality.
Okay. The question is, we talked about SAML and OpenID Connect groups. Is it also possible to have Active Directory groups? Um, I'll get back to you on that front. Um, so, sorry. So uh, if your Active Directory has been used for through SAML, uh, then it is possible. So it becomes a SAML group. Yeah. I, I know that it works through SAML because we, we've done that through SAML. ArcGIS, the difference between ArcGIS Online and Enterprise? Okay. Bo bo both are the same. So we, we share a similar code base where possible between online and uh, enterprise. So uh, uh, th that is similar. Question. So the question is, uh, if we have a lot of people using ArcGIS logins and you want to uh, migrate to SAML-based logins, is there an easy way? The answer is no, we don't have an easy way. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty painstaking, but we are hearing a lot of the same questions that uh, um, basically you're looking at creating another user account, and then for that member, just transferring all of the content over, making sure that that member is set up the same way. So that's, we have user, in the, in the UI we have the ability to you know, transfer content from one member to another. And we recently made some improvements to delete a member and just transfer all of the groups and the items over. However, the part I think that we are missing in the UI is the ability to say that I have this one user and they belong to these 20 groups. Take this other member and make them uh, you know, also belong to those 20 groups. We don't have that. So that's the one piece that's missing, but it still is going to be like one user at a time. Um, and if you're, if you're managing a, an organization with like hundreds of members, we don't have an easy way to do that change. So that's something that we, we are hearing about and we'll see what we can do to help. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I, I'm, sh I'm not sure I, you, repeat, you got it, okay. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Um, so if you're saying like how uh, does the group membership flow into RGS online? Yeah. Right, so um, as an administrator, um, like you create a group in uh, RGS online, and while creating a group, you need to specify the exact group name uh, that is available on the SAML side, and that's how you link it. And when the mem uh, member signs in, upon each sign in, their membership is checked and uh, uh, they are either added to the group or removed from the group based on uh, what uh, is done on the identity provider side. Okay, so the group, group name needs no, to it, match? It's not the group name itself. It's in the group there's a setting. Setting. That there's a setting explicitly uh, asked. Uh, if you have enabled uh, SAML groups at the organization level, while configuring, uh, creating a group, you will have one more option that says like, uh, is this group based off of uh, uh, SAML login, uh, SAML group membership? Uh, and that's the place where you need to specify the group name. The group name on, uh, of the online does not matter at that point. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there's also something you need to do in the SAML configuration itself to say that this group is going to flow through, right? Uh, yes. Uh, at the organization level, while configuring the SAML, you need to toggle on as an administrator that you, you want the group membership to flow in as part of the login because it, it could be a sensitive thing that might not be needed, then it should not be uh, allowed. So that's a configuration on the SAML uh, at the org level that needs to be turned on. 
Any other questions? All right, thank you all for joining this session. Thank you.